So I'm going to stop there, Ryan. I'm going to turn it over to you. We look forward to your presentation. Great. Thank you for the introduction. Let me just share my PowerPoint real quickly here. Everyone can see all right, I assume. Wonderful. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Ryan Kurz. I'm really excited to be speaking with everyone today about an issue that I would say I'm both deeply fascinated by and also deeply concerned with, and that's the tremendous rise in disinformation on US social media uh, that we've seen over the course of the past five years, specifically uh, following the success of Russian disinformation um, in the 2016 US presidential election. Um, and so this paper is sort of an exploration of how other actors have begun to copy Russian methods. Um, so first, a couple of key terms to identify. Disinformation is the uh, intentionally spread false information, um, and that can take a lot of different forms, but to contrast with misinformation, uh, which is typically understood as unintentionally spread uh, false information. And then also influence operations, which are operations to influence thought or decision making, and this can also take a variety of forms as well. But essentially, we've seen a pretty tremendous rise, not only in the US, but also globally, of uh, how quickly disinformation is spreading because of the increasing spread of information just generally on social media. Um, social media has enabled disinfor or disinformation as well as regular information to spread uh, so quickly that most people are consuming so much information they don't know what's actually true and false. Uh, one Oxford study actually found that false stories were uh, spreading six times faster than real stories, just to show you that false information uh, is even more pervasive at many times than accurate information. And this is not only, of course, a US problem, but between 2017 and 2019, um, disinformation operations or influence operations were used in 70 countries. Uh, so as I mentioned, the intention of my paper was to sort of understand and describe how international domestic actors have replicated Russian disinformation methods uh, on social media in the past five years. And I divided this into five key sections, which were an analysis of Russian methods, particularly on uh, their 2016 operation on social media, international actors, and then domestic actors. So first, it's pretty critical, I think, to understand Russian strategy and methods so that we have something to compare our later examples to. Um, in terms of strategy, a key component is that many Russian theorists essentially believe that the West is waging its own information war on Russia that has been going since the Soviet period. Um, Mariga Simonyan, when talking about Russia Today, or RT as it's known, uh, in 2012, um, and why Russia needed to counter uh, Western information operations, stated that we're waging an information war and with the whole Western world. Well, it is impossible to just start making weapons when the war has already begun. So this sort of drives the desire for Russia to act in their eyes in a defensive manner through these disinformation operations. Uh, and this manifests itself in uh, the goals of degrading democratic processes and institutions, sowing chaos in external political systems, exploiting pre-existing societal and political fissures, uh, particularly in the US, uh, and then overloading the information ecosystem with falsehood so that people cannot tell the difference between true and false because there are too many narratives to discern. Um, and what makes this different than more traditional propaganda is that it was not explicitly pro-Russian. Um, much of the disinformation was actually very patriotic or very pro-American or supporting um, LGBTQ or Black Lives Matter organizations. So it was more about just creating this chaos than exactly reaching an ideological or policy goal. And so I decided to use uh, the Global Engagement Centers, which is the State Department's organization for dealing with disinformation, there are five pillars of the Russian disinformation ecosystem to break down these different methods. And so this goes from most overt being government uh, communications down to uh, strategic uh, global messaging, proxy sources, weaponization of social media, and then finally cyber enabled disinformation. And in my next slide, I'm gonna go over sort of what those looked like in 2016. Um, in 2016, we really saw sort of the most effective disinformation operation on social media uh, that we'd really ever seen before. These concepts and these uh, tools and methods have been used before, 
but this is definitely the the most prime example of how these operations can be successful uh, on social media in the United States. And so I'm gonna go through a few of these examples here uh, because I think they provide a useful way of understanding some of my later examples. And so first, official government communications. This is, I would say pretty obvious. It's essentially um, when Russian government officials or social media outlets are posting conspiracies or amplifying conspiracies, or uh, oftentimes they engage in what I would call trolling. So they reply to other official accounts um, to basically get a rise out of people. Um, and what's in interesting about this is that they use English. So it's intended for an English speaking audience. Um, and these provide more legitimacy to other claims because official government uh, employees are stating them. Next, state-funded global messaging. This would be RT and Sputnik, which are two explicitly uh, Russian government connected global media outlets. Um, they're used to challenge mainstream media narratives and Western narratives about global events, as well as amplify pre-existing conspiratorial uh, individuals. Uh, and they're pretty useful for providing legitimate articles for some of these other disinformation methods as well. For proxy sources, we tend to think of this as like your fake news websites. So they're not real websites, but they post a tremendous amount of articles that contain disinformation or that are just blatantly false. Um, and they're used to essentially launder information. So you have one article be the, the sort of uh, origin of a claim that's cited by another article, cited by another article, and this can go down the line. So it's very difficult to find the origin of a claim. And in a sense, it uh, legitimizes a claim because they're able to cite other outlets. Um, and one study actually found that there were over 200 websites that were repeating Russian disinform disinformation narratives in 2016. Um, and the use of proxy sources ended up being a pretty effective method by uh, other state actors as well. And then moving on to the weaponization of social media, this is what we tend to think of um, most commonly as like the foot soldiers for how disinformation is spread. Uh, these are your automated bots, which are just automated accounts that'll spam hashtags or uh, spam articles on social media or trolls, which are individuals who um, essentially just try to get a rise out of people online or antagonize. Um, but essentially they're impersonating real Americans on social media. Uh, the most prime example of this being the now infamous internet research agency, which is a troll farm that's based out of St. Petersburg and is still operational to this day, where people would come all hours of the day and impersonate Americans online on Twitter and Facebook and other social media sites. Uh, and what was really interesting about this is that more than half of the content that they were generating or posting was not even related to a political or social agenda. It was just to build up this legitimacy that they were actually Americans on social media. So that they, when they did engage in the spread of this information, it was far more effective. Um, and ultimately millions of people saw posts by accounts linked to the um, internet research agency. And this method of using troll farms and sort of, I would say, industrializing this process, it has been replicated uh, in other places, specifically Africa as well. Um, cyber enabled disinformation. We think of this mostly as using cyber espionage or cyber hacking to acquire materials uh, that you then leak. Oftentimes these are embarrassing um, or they can be doctored uh, in some way. Uh, they call this hack and release strategy, the DNC hack in 2015-2016 uh, being the most notable example. Um, and then that uh, hacked information is laundered through other outlets such as WikiLeaks or IRA trolls or bots. Um, so these are just some examples, but they provide an idea of how this whole system works together. Uh, one thing to understand is like many of these agents are not actually connected, um, but they're all working towards a similar goal of moving disinformation into uh, the US information space as well. So in terms of international replicators, there is a tremendous number working right now. Uh, specifically in the US, we saw accounts related to Iran, China, Turkey, uh, and of course, Russia taken down by Twitter and Facebook over the past number of years. Um, 
but I chose to use Iran as my case study because I think they're the most interesting example of a very sophisticated and expansive influence operation that mirrors a lot of the methods used by Russia in 2016. Uh, and specifically, I'm looking at the endless Mayfly operation and some of its related elements. Uh, and so this operation was uh, intended to use inauthentic personas and social media accounts to spread falsehoods and amplify narratives that were critical of Saudi Arabia, the United States, Israel, as well as attacking Trump and uh, US Middle Eastern foreign policy more generally. So the first element we saw people uh, or Iranian operatives who are impersonating experts, writers, uh, while at the same time building relationships with other people within this policy community online. Um, and comparing to Russian disinformation, which often leaned more, uh, was more right-leaning, this was more to a left-leaning audience. We actually have an example here on the top left of the screen of a post from this operation of someone who was impersonating a freelance writer interacting with a real person. Um, and so as you can tell, it was not very uh, well done because it's pretty obvious that this is not an American just based on the way it's written, but it demonstrates that these people were not only just posting this content, but they were trying to interact with influential individuals within their communities. Um, another dynamic was the use of proxy sources once again. So fake media sites that were um, another not very sophisticated method, but they would change you know, a letter or use a misspelling of a legitimate media outlet um, and then format the website to appear like that. So for my example here, it was um, trying to impersonate the Atlantic and it would link to a disinformation article that would look like the Atlantic. There are actually times where these articles were picked up by legitimate media sources. I believe Reuters actually picked up an article that was used by one of these fake outlets. Um, and they demonstrate that these tactics, though I would say not very sophisticated once again, uh, are pretty effective at fooling people. Next, information laundering was a key component of the Iranian operation, specifically through the International Union of Virtual Media, uh, which was pretty explicitly tied to Iran, but it's essentially operated a whole network of websites and media outlets that were spreading disinformation. And they would be, uh, articles from these sites would then be used for ads on websites like Facebook and Instagram to amplify more disinformation. Uh, actually here on the bottom left, I have a cartoon that was part of an editorial on one of these Iranian disinformation sites attacking Trump for his handling of COVID-19. And this was a pretty popular uh, topic for Iranian disinformation in 2020 was attacking Trump for COVID and for a, a whole host of other policy issues. Um, but it's very interesting that most people would probably not look at this and think of this as you know, part of a disinformation operation. But, but these tactics are very common because people like to repost interesting articles or repost comics they think are funny. Um, but it seems benign, but it does have a more insidious purpose. Um, many of these sites were taken down. The DOJ shut down 92 domain names that were used as part of this operation uh, in 2020. So as this operation became more exposed, uh, many of these sites were taken down. Though Iran continued to use methods even up to the beginning of the campaign season in October of 2020, uh, Iran hacked voter information in a number of states, used emails from that hacked information to then uh, impersonate members of the far-right Proud Boy organization to intimidate voters. Uh, but it was not to intimidate them to vote for Trump. It was a means of essentially making Trump look worse because this was just after his debate where he had made controversial comments about the Proud Boys and they were trying to play towards people's fear of this organization. Um, so once again, it wasn't uh, something that fooled very many people, but it showed that they were combining these methods, these cyber enabled hacking, as well as impersonation of Americans um, in a similar way to how Russia would also hack voter information pretty frequently. Ultimately, it's not very clear how uh, a lot of these elements are linked just because of the limitations of open source uh, intelligence on this or even how effective they are. We know that you know, hundreds of thousands of people 
cumulatively saw these posts uh, or these articles, but we don't know if that really changed policy uh, at all. But ultimately, we saw really a replication of a lot of these different Russian methods. Next, for domestic actors, uh, domestic disinformation is, I would say, far more pervasive and far more effective than international disinformation. Um, as one report I read put it best, Americans are the best at misleading Americans. You don't have to go through the process of creating these fake personas because real people exist who are willing to essentially funnel this disinformation. It also comes with trying to identify what is intentional spread, unintentional spread, uh, the people who are potentially, you know, true believers in what they believe or who are like grifters who have a commercial stake in spreading false information. Um, it's also difficult to deal with because it's a pretty politicized issue. Uh, the political right in the U.S. is far more susceptible to disinformation. One New York University study found that on average, um, articles posted on misinformation sites uh, got 65% more engagement than true articles on right-leaning sites, while center and left media outlets on social media actually got penalized for posting misinformation. Um, so we see that one side of the aisle is typically a little bit more susceptible to this, and that has politicized the issue for some of the, the domestic elements as well. Uh, there are also just more motivations for spreading disinformation uh, domestically. Um, we saw the Trump campaign raise $250 million um, in just a few weeks following the 2020 election, uh, basically on the back of bogus claims about the election being stolen. And then only 10 million of the 250 million was actually spent on their, their legal effort to overturn the election. So it can be pretty lucrative to use these kinds of false narratives. Um, for my case study though, there are a number I could have chosen, COVID, anti-vax, the election, um, but I chose the Stop the Steal movement because I think this demonstrated the most uh, evident example of disinformation leading to real world consequences, um, specifically with the January 6th Capitol insurrection. Um, we saw people motivated to go and actually act in a violent manner because of these falsehoods that were being spread. So the first and most uh, important difference compared to Russian disinformation or other international influence operations so that was that this was a much more top down rather than bottom up. So it was GOP officials, conservative commentators, Trump himself that were spreading some of these key lies about the election, uh, both in the lead up to the 2020 US presidential election as well as following the election. And these people have millions of followers and can um, spread false information to hundreds of thousands of people in minutes. Um, so they're incredibly effective at dispersing this information. And uh, they could be called essentially super spreaders of this false information. Uh, and I called this process sort of priming the pump in the lead up to the election because these officials were essentially convincing their supporters that certain things were to occur, that the election was going to be rigged in a certain way, so that then once the election hit, any kind of false information that was cycling through social media, uh, people were primed to want to believe, to want to pick up because of essentially months and months of conditioning about the election. Um, following the election, we saw Numerous conspiracies spread online uh, about ballot shredding, mail in voting, dead people voting, a whole host of different things. Um, we would see a photo that would then get picked up by a popular conservative commentator and tweeted out, and it wouldn't be for a day or two later that it'd be disproven. But by then, millions of people saw it and were convinced that this was uh, an example of election fraud. Uh, and then, like I mentioned, this, this translated into real people. Um, congregating online. Uh, if you look at this post on the bottom right, this is actually an image of a Facebook group that gained over 300,000 followers in a day following the November election. Uh, that was eventually taken down by Facebook because of calls for violence in the group, as well as um, people essentially organizing to go to rallies. And even though this group was closed, people flooded into other platforms, into other groups. Uh, so it became very pervasive and fast moving online. And unfortunately, it's still very much uh, a part of um, 
of the conservative thought related to the election. One poll found that six in 10 Republicans still believe the election was stolen. So this disinformation has left its mark, I would say, and have been incredibly effective. In terms of uh, conclusion, there are sort of a number of top line uh, takeaways that I had. The first being that Russian disinformation methods are definitely being replicated by domestic and international actors. Second, disinformation methods on social media are constantly being innovated and replicated. How this is pertinent to Russian studies, I think to understanding disinformation operations as a whole, it's key to understand how Russia views disinformation and how their operations work. And then finally, what can be done? Well, we see fact checking, account removal, labeling of false and suspicious material, as well as regulation and public education all being things that are either being done or talked about being done. But as I mentioned, it's very difficult uh, to deal with this information because new methods of moving it onto uh, or legitimizing it are constantly being developed. And then finally, just to leave you guys, I have a quote that I think like really describes why social media is the prime platform um, for this material because it essentially creates an environment that endorses engagement with false material. And I'll just read this. When you're in the business of maximizing engagement, you're not interested in truth, you're not interested in harm, divisiveness, conspiracy. In fact, those are your friends. So essentially social media companies have bred an environment where this content is going to be effective. Um, and that's why these operations have been so effective. So thank you. Thank you, Ryan. That was a great presentation. Um, participants, I aired earlier, sorry, I have a different um, lower ribbon. The raise hand function is in the participant screen. Um, um, so please uh, ask your questions. Ryan, I'll start off and just ask you quickly. It seems that Russia did not interfere in the 2020 presidential election in the same way as it did in 2016. Do you have a sense of why? Is that because the attempt to foment domestic disinformation um, campaigns and agents was as successful as you portrayed it to be? That's a great question. I think Russia definitely changed its tactics going into 2020. I don't think there was necessarily a need to create a hostile political environment in the US, unfortunately, because that environment already exists as a result of the politicization within the US political system. But we did see significant amounts of uh, operations related to um, getting info to the Trump campaign about, uh, I'm sure you remember um, Biden's son and his laptop, that was actually part of Russian disinformation operations. So it was definitely uh, not conducted in the same way as 2016, but there were still efforts made by Russian intelligence organizations to move damaging evidence about the Bidens or about uh, other topics basically into the US political space. Great, um, Professor Doherty. Yes, thank you. Uh, whoops, can you see me? Oh, sorry, <laughs> I have my my blockers, so I am not hacked. <laughs> Sorry about that. Uh, Ryan, that was really excellent. And since you were my student, I thought um, I would just ask you a question about the evolution of techniques. And you were starting to kind of get into that. There is one that's quite immediate that we've heard of. And I'm sure it kind of came out after you finished your, your paper, obviously. But um, it's the use of deep fakes, and specifically the one that I have read about is uh, Lenny Volkov, who is the head of Navalny's operation, uh, had a deep fake um, phishing attack in which people, apparently from Russia, uh, impersonated him. And the surmisal is that that's being used not only to set up Navalny's people, uh, for embarrassment, but the organization that answers that and says, yes, I'd like to talk with you, could be embarrassed. And it's, it's just a very interesting technique. So um, I guess the question would be, have you seen any, um, you know, real use of deep fakes like that? And, and perhaps a broader question, where are we going with that? Thanks. No, that is a great point. I, I definitely was very fascinated when I saw reports about an actual effective use of deep fakes being used, because I think 
for a while, it was still uh, very obvious to tell uh, what a deep fake was. But now we see people um, on social media sites like TikTok who can create deep fakes of actors that essentially look very indistinguishable from real people. And I think going into the future, that's going to be a much more popular way of disseminating disinformation um, as well. Though it's difficult to tell what the exact response is going to be to that kind of information. Unfortunately, I think it's going to have to be more of a rapid re response style, which as we know, isn't all that effective um, at dealing with falsehoods that get spread quickly. Um, so I think you're definitely correct that in the future, as deep fakes become more pervasive, as well as easier to use, um, the actual hardware requirements to make deep fakes are more accessible to more people now. Um, they're going to become very pervasive, especially on social media. So I think that's probably one of the most um, concerning future methods that's going to be more pervasive, um, much more so than it is right now. Okay, thank you very much. Kissin, the two minutes that we have left, do you want to elaborate a little bit on what you think um, the U.S. could do um, to try to counter this, other countries that are targets, um, just generally, what is a good response? That is a, that's a fantastic question as well. Uh, you should all come back and listen to Eleanor's presentation next week, where she talks about how other countries have been dealing with disinformation. Uh, but states who have essentially been on the front lines of Russian disinformation, specifically in Eastern Europe, uh, specifically the Baltic states, um, they're working on methods like public education is a very big one. So people have more literacy, um, getting their news from more diverse sources. Those are definitely the easiest ones and some of the most widespread examples right now. But you also have smaller, uh, you have countries that essentially employ smaller organizations to debunk or try to disprove a lot of these falsehoods and do reports on that. Though they still essentially have very limited audience uh, compared to the people that actually see the false information. Um, as it pertains to the US, regulation of social media is very limited. Um, it basically re requires public pressure right now to get social media companies to want to take down this kind of disinformation. Um, of course, after the Capitol insurrection, we saw a big crackdown on far right disinformation and misinformation, uh, taking down the Trump account off a bunch of different platforms. It's I don't think something we expected to happen um, before the insurrection but public pressure mounted and these companies realized that it was more beneficial, um, the free market solution, I guess, as you'd say, uh, to their image to actually try to remove this content from their platform. Um, but until there are concrete regulations about what these companies should do in terms of fact checking or taking down accounts, it's gonna be very difficult to deal with domestic actors who spread this kind of information. Absolutely. Well, Ryan, thank you.